So today is the final Sunday in the sermon series and Sunday morning class series on the creation era of scripture. And we will pick up this material again after Lent and after the month of April. Uh, so we'll take a little break and then we'll come back to this material that I think will take us about two years before we get through the whole of scripture. But today's reading is Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. A Sunday school teacher was with his class of boys, and the topic was living the Christian life. Now, unfortunately, this teacher decided to use himself as a good example of what to do and how to live. So he asked the class, why do people call me a Christian? There was a pause, and then one boy answered, maybe it's because they don't know you. It's always very dangerous to use yourself as a good example because, of course, other people see our faults much more clearly than we can see them. God, of course, sees us completely, the positive and the not-so-positive attributes. But we can be grateful for the grace of God and the love of God that continues to guide us even as he convicts us with, of sin and shows us how to deal with it in our lives. Now last week we talked about Noah. And the judgment of the flood we know did not deter humanity from sin and wickedness. And yet still God made a covenant with Noah, all humanity, and the creatures of the earth. God said, never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And this was truly a covenant of grace because humanity had no obligations to maintain the covenant. The onus was completely on God. And of course, humanity would continue to sin. In fact, in these early chapters of Genesis, we've seen a progression in the wickedness of humanity, the broken relationships deteriorating even further with almost every new chapter. In Genesis 3, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, there is broken relationship with God and between the husband and wife. And then in chapter 4, with Cain and Abel, there is broken relationship within the family, brother from brother. At the end of chapter 9, the end of the story of Noah, sin brought about broken relationship between parent and child, as we see the relationships between Noah and his sons deteriorate. So finally, here in chapter 11, the broken relationship is between people groups. The chapter begins by telling us that there was once a common language that was spoken by all people. 
Initially, the people were wanderers, but they found a place to settle down, and then they began to build a great city and a great tower. Now, unfortunately, over the centuries, there have been some erroneous conclusions about this story that aren't really supported by the scripture or informed by the cultural context. So, for example, some people find in this story an anti-urban bias, meaning that cities are somehow more sinful than any place else. But I don't know about you, I see human beings sinning everywhere, in the cities, in the suburbs, in the rural areas, and everywhere in between. Another misreading of the story is that this is humanity's attempt to climb up into heaven. So what really is going on here? What is the sin? And why the judgment of scattering everyone in confusing language? One thing that is very key to understanding the story is to know something about this tower that the people built. The tower was probably what is called a ziggurat. It's something that was very common to the area at the time. And a ziggurat was a tall, tower-like construction, 60 up to 200 feet. And it was made of mud bricks, and it was packed with dirt inside. The ziggurats were built for the use of the gods. They were considered holy, but they weren't temples. People didn't go to a ziggurat to worship. In fact, a ziggurat was usually built near a temple. There was a stairway or a ramp around leading to the top where there was a small room with a bed and a table for the god. All of this was meant to be a convenience for the god to travel between heaven and earth. So the god could come down and receive the people's worship and hopefully bless them. The tower was not built for people to climb to heaven, but as I say, for the God to come down to earth. The other thing I want to point out is that unlike the flood story, there is no righteous person or a family that is featured in this story. It's a story about humanity in general and the motives for building the city and the tower. We're told that they wanted to build to make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So they wanted to stay together. They wanted to be unified. Well, what's wrong with that? We know unity is important. We have to look carefully at God's response. God said, look, they are one people and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. Now, at first glance, it might look like God is somehow threatened by what humanity is doing, but we know that's not true because that's not the God of the Bible. So then what is wrong with, as God says, that nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them? I mean, isn't it a good thing that humanity can prosper and accomplish amazing things? Well, what have we seen about the nature of humanity all along in these early chapters of Genesis? We have seen that humanity is prone to sinfulness, to selfishness and greed and fighting for power. Remember what God said about humanity in the story of Noah. He's looking out at all the people of the earth, and God said every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And we've seen evidence of that over and over again in these early chapters of Genesis. Human beings have been given tremendous authority and responsibility at the time of creation to fill the earth and subdue it, 
to rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We have a power along with all these amazing gifts and abilities to do incredible things. However, we are not wise in how we use our blessings. We are not wise in how we use the gift of creation and the gifts and abilities and intellect that God has given to us. Our sinful tendencies corrupt every aspect of human life and every accomplishment. It's a moral and spiritual pollution that infects every aspect of every institution, culture, religion, etc. Reformed theologian Cornelius Plantinga speaks of it as perversion. Perversion is the turning of loyalty, energy, and desire away from God and God's project in the world. It is the diversion of construction materials for the city of God to side products of our own. What he's saying is that we take the construction materials, the blessings God has given to us, and we use them for our own purposes instead of for God's purposes. If we're left to ourselves, we are going to use what we have been given to follow our own pursuits rather than doing the things that glorify God. So God's judgment in Genesis 11 was to confuse and scatter the people. God was protecting us from ourselves. Yes, it was an act of judgment, but it was an act of grace. Now remember, in Acts chapter 2, we have the story of Pentecost. Many scholars see that Pentecost and the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church as a reversal of what happened at Babel. In Genesis 11, as I say, humanity was scattered and separated by different languages. What happened after that is that humanity's sinfulness manifested in the tribes of people, the countries and the cultures that developed. There was a sense of superiority that built up. And people began to look down on others who were different. There was tribal and national conflict and the evils of slavery and ethnic cleansing. And friends, even in our country, the land of the free, society is racially structured and we are separated by our fears and prejudices. But at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out on all the followers of Christ. The Holy Spirit is given without regard to status or gender or nationality or culture or language. The followers of Christ at Pentecost were empowered to speak in different languages so that the people that had gathered there could hear the gospel in their own language. The miracles of Pentecost were both the speaking and the hearing. In understanding. And by breaking down these divisions, God demonstrated how now his people are defined by a common faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. John Calvin, a Reformed scholar, the father of Presbyterianism, when he was writing a commentary on Acts chapter 2, he said, Although their language may differ in sound, they all speak the same thing while they cry, Abba, Father. You see, the Holy Spirit unifies all of us. Yes, linguistic and cultural and ethnic and racial divisions, or what shall I say, differences, remain. Those things are not wiped away. In fact, they're necessary Because the church, united in Christ, united by the Holy Spirit, needs to move forward in God's mission toward all nations and all cultures. 
Christians come from a variety of backgrounds and a variety of language, but the power of the Holy Spirit is what enables us to break through hostilities and hatred and fear of those who are different. Jesus himself said in Luke 13, people will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. The church, the faithful community of brothers and sisters in Christ, is God's model of what human community should be like. In fact, our Presbyterian Book of Order says that the church is a provisional demonstration of what God intends for all humanity. That is a very tall order. But our call as Holy Spirit-empowered people is to manifest this reversal of Babel. We are God's display of what humanity looks like when people are free from hatred and prejudice and fear that is based on race and cultural and nationality. We are God's reconciled people, called to ministries of reconciliation and bridge building. We no longer live by the flesh and that ugly divisiveness where one group is pitted against another. Instead, we live by the Spirit, loving one another as God in Christ has loved us and sacrificially serving one another for the glory to God. Now, I am grateful that Some years ago, God called our church to be bridge builders. And since then, we have been developing relationships out in our community and hopefully breaking down walls. I pray that God will continue to help us become a provisional demonstration of what God intends for humanity. I want to close now with a prayer by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. So let's pray. Most gracious and all-wise God, before whose face the generations rise and fall, thou in whom we live and move and have our being, we thank thee for all of thy good and gracious gifts, for life and for health, for food and for raiment, for the beauties of nature and human nature. We come before thee, painfully aware of our inadequacies and shortcomings. We realize that we stand surrounded with the mountains of love, and we deliberately dwell in the valley of hate. We stand amid the forces of truth and deliberately lie. We are forever offered the high road, and yet we choose to travel the low road. For these sins, O God, forgive. Break the spell of that which blinds our minds. Purify our hearts that we may see thee, O God. And in these turbulent days when fear and doubt are mounting high, give us broad visions, penetrating eyes, and power of endurance. Help us to work with renewed vigor for a warless world, for a better distribution of wealth, and for a brother and sisterhood that transcends race or color. In the name and spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen.